Well, good morning. I would like you, if you would, to turn with me in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 8. We're in a section uh, from eight th- uh, chapters 8 through chapter 11, where we're looking at the Ichabod section, the reason why the glory of the God of Israel could no longer stay in the temple. And in chapter 8, particularly, we're going to be looking at the defiled house, how the the very temple, which was the center of Jewish worship, the place where God's glory dwelled uh, amongst them, how that had become defiled. So we're going to read from verse 1, and we'll read down to verse 15, although the chapter goes beyond that, but uh, at least for our purpose of reading, we'll read the first 15 verses. So it begins this way. It says, that, and it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house and the elders of Judah sat before me that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire from the appearance of his loins, even downward fire and from his loins, even upward as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, and to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, There, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now uh, the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north. And behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, and behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold, the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And again, God will bless this very sobering portion of his word to our hearts this morning. So we're beginning in verse 2. We looked and have already covered uh, verse 1, I think, uh, last time. So we're going to break in in verse 2, and we're going to get uh, a glimpse of what he uh, he saw, the prophet. Uh, and, and this is, again, the second kind of prophetic section. Remember, there's a, the first uh, prophecies were given uh, 14 months earlier. This is Now, the second uh, section of prophecy uh, in his book. And so he says, I behold. And what he sees in verse 2 is uh, what he had previously seen in chapter 1 and verse 26. It was the one who had been seated on the divine throne. 
And so if you look back with me just for a second to Ezekiel 126, and above the firmament there was uh, over their heads was the likeness of a throne and the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Of course, it describes that, that appearance in verse 27, the color of amber, the appearance of fire round about within, and the appearance of his loins, even upwards from the appearance of his loins, even downwards, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about it. So this, uh, what he's seeing now is, identical to what he saw in chapter one uh, when he got his first prophecy by the banks of Kibar. It's the one who sits on the chariot throne. Of course, we believe that that is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ, Christ in his pre-incarnate glory. And of course, we explained, and I just reiterated for all of our benefit, that this thought here of uh, his loins, uh, the appearance of fire, uh, Scripture tells us, Hebrews 12, 29, we know it well, our God is a consuming fire. Fire often connected with judgment, and of course, he's on a mission of judgment. He is bringing judgment to the house of Judah because of the abominations which they are doing. And so uh, it's it, he is seeing what he has seen before. What is unique, what is different uh, in this particular occasion is what we find in verse 3. Because you'll notice in verse 3, he says, He put forth the form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoked the jealousy. So what, what we find here is kind of something that's absolutely unique in the entire word of God. No other uh, incident like this where Ezekiel is lifted up by a, a lock of the hair of his head by the, the pre-incarnate Christ and taken from where he was sitting in his house uh, amongst uh, along the banks of the Kibar uh, in captivity, and he is taken in spirit, it says, from where he is, taken up between heaven and earth, and then transported to Jerusalem, to the very temple in the city of Jerusalem. And so, of course, the big question is, did he take him physically, or was this spiritual and in a vision? And again, it would seem to me, and again, I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. There's lots of ink being written about this, whether it was a physical thing or whether it was just spiritual in vision. But it seems to me that it was spiritual and in vision. And the reason I say that is because uh, he talks about he brought me in the visions of God. You notice that again in verse 3, uh, he says, He put forth the form of a hand, took me by a lock of mine head. The Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. And so it, it seems it may not have been physically transporting his body to Jerusalem, but only in spirit and in vision. And when we get to chapter 11, it it would appear perhaps that he didn't leave Babylon <laughs> except in spirit and in vision. Uh, when we get to 11, uh, we'll just break in in verse 22. It says, Then did the cherubim lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east of the city. And it says, Afterward, the Spirit took me up, and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I spake unto them of the captivity all the things the Lord had showed me. And so it seems like he's just transported in vision and in spirit to see these things in Jerusalem and then brought back to tell what he had seen uh, to those those elders, by the way, the elders of Judah, verse, verse 1, that sat before him. 
And so that seems to be what is taking place. Although, again, I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. It's very hard to know. Was it physical or was it spiritual and envisioned? But it seems to me it was spiritual and envisioned. And he has shown during this this transportation and this visit to Jerusalem, he has shown a fourfold view of the sins of the people. God showed Ezekiel what was literally happening in both in an outward and also in a spiritual sense, where God's people were at and why the glory had to leave and why judgment had to fall. He's being shown exactly why these things were a necessity. Now, what's also interesting is you have another occasion where he is taken in spirit, uh, but it's a much happier occasion. And I want us just to to look forward just for a second, uh, both look forward in our Bibles and look forward in anticipation uh, to getting to this place where he's taken again to Jerusalem, but he's shown a much happier story. And that is in Ezekiel 43. And uh, when we see Ezekiel 43 and verse 5, you get the same idea where it says, so the spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And so what's interesting is that Ezekiel, first of all, gets to see the glory leaving the house of God in chapters 8 through 11. But in chapter 43, God takes him and allows him to see the return of the glory of the God of Israel to the house. Now, of course, contextually, from chapter 40 through 48, we're looking at the millennial temple and the the Lord's return to reign uh, and be in his house again, his glory returning. So it's a glorious time uh, witnessing the glory of the Lord once again filling the house. But before then, we have to have this first visit, which is not a happy visit. So he says, again, in three through five, what we see is, the first thing that he sees is this image of jealousy. It's located in the temple area. And so he, he takes him. And again, the end of verse three, he says, that, to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And so the this area, the, the, the north area, uh, gate, the gate that's towards the north, would be the gate, looking towards the north, would be the gate where the priests normally entered to do their work, because this is where the altar was and the sacrifices were killed. How do we know that? Let's look back to Leviticus chapter 1, and we'll just see that that's exactly the location of where the altar of God was and where the priests offered their burnt offerings and peace offerings and all the various offerings found in Leviticus 1 through 7. He says in Leviticus 1 verse 11, he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord and the priest Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. So there's the thought, this northward uh, direction. This is the door that the priest would come through. And what did they see now? When the children of Israel came through that door, when the priest came through there, of course, remember Ezekiel's a priest. This is why it would be a horrifying thing for him. He'd been uh, kind of apprentice trained for this in view uh, to go into the house of God. He'd been taken into captivity. He hadn't had that experience. Now he gets his first glimpse, as it were, of the of the house of God uh, from an in, inward view. And what does he see? He sees right by that gate there's an image of jealousy which provokes to jealousy. What is this image of jealousy that he sees here? Now, the word image is the word semel, which means an idol. So there's an idol in the very court of the house of God, right where the sacrifices to the Lord are being offered. Now, can you imagine why, why God's glory can't stay? Uh, they brought this in. And of course, uh, the 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 thought is that this particular idol was what was known as an Asherah pole uh, to Asherah, the queen of heaven, the goddess connected with fertility, with sex and all of that. And so you would say that 
uh, one of the things that had happened, if we could kind of summarize, is that had, there was a sensuality that had entered in to the worship of the God who is infinitely holy in the very temple of God. Sensuality and worship. Now, this has been a problem, a longstanding problem, this this, this Asherah pole. Uh, it's not the first time it's been set up. So I want to just look at some kind of the history of this. And so we want to go back to Second Kings, and we'll learn about, uh, of course, the reign of wicked King Manasseh. And if you if you remember, the part of the the judgment on Judah, uh, the necessity of judgment was because of the absolute wickedness of Manasseh, who was the son of godly King Hezekiah. And uh, so, if we look at Second Kings twenty one. And again, it's kind of a sad thing, isn't it, that you have this incredibly godly king, and actually he's given extra years of life, and during those extra years of life, he has a son called Manasseh, who turns out to be the wickedest king that that ever reigned in Judah. And so chapter 21, which talks about the reign of Manasseh, it says in verse 7, he set a graven image of the grove, that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. So the first one to have the absolute audacity to actually, it's not that there weren't Asherah poles all on the mountains and all over Israel uh, that, that we know about, we've learned about in previous messages, but this man had the audacity to even put it in the very house of God itself. And so he was the first one to do it. Now, we we do learn, and if you look at Second Chronicles, uh, the, the most amazing thing about wicked King Manasseh is that he actually repented and got saved. <laughs> and it's it, you wouldn't believe it unless you read it. And of course, it, 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 what it does tell us is, uh, no matter how wayward a person is, even if they've had a, you know, we, we often pray, some of us pray for prodigals. Well, this was a, a a very wicked prodigal, and I'm sure there were a lot of people praying for him, and he actually came to repentance. And it was a very encouraging story. Chapter 33 of Second Chronicles, verse 7, it says, He set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, I put my name forever. So there's a reiteration of what we saw in Second Kings 21. But now look at verse 13 of the same chapter, 33, Chronicles 33, Second Chronicles 33, verse 13 through 15. It says, and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom, then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. And so amazing that, so he actually is a king that repents, cries out to God, he'd been taken into Babylon, the, the king of Babylon allows him to return uh, to Jerusalem. It says in verse 14, now after this, he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gihon, in the valley, even to the entering of the fish gate, and compassed about Ophel, and raised it up a very great height, and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. And he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord, and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord, and in Jerusalem, and cast them out of the city. And so he try to, as it were, make amends uh, for the wickedness that he had been guilty of. And uh, amazing, really, to think about this, that uh, in his repentance, uh, he he tried to, as it were, make restitution, to put right the evil that he had done. And so he, he makes a great effort. I, I was talking to somebody last night about an incident in an assembly where uh, after the incident had happened, some of the people became very convicted that they had sinned against the Lord and they had gone out of their way to make sure that every person connected or knew about the incident 
that they, they pleaded for their forgiveness and they made every attempt to put things right. It's a good thing when people want to put things right. And that's what he wants to do. And so he does it. But the amazing thing is that somehow, even after he had done that, it somehow got put back again. Because if you look back at Second Kings chapter 23, we find that in Josiah's revival, it says in verse 6, he brought out of the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem to the brook Kidron and burnt it at the brook Kidron and stamped it small to powder, cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. So amazingly enough, even after Manasseh had took it out, somebody had put it back in again so that Josiah has to once again remove it. And now here we are again in Ezekiel chapter 8. And guess what? After Josiah had removed it, it found its way back again. And I suppose it's a, it's a big lesson, really, isn't it, about the stubbornness of sin and rebellion. Are there things in our lives that we thought we dealt with once and for all? And, and then somehow we find they creep back in again. <laughs> and we're back where we were. And we have to put it out again. And then if we're not careful, we're not diligent, we find it creeps back in again. And there it is once again. And so sin is a stubborn, stubborn thing, isn't it? Rebellion is a stubborn thing. And of course, the nation, th this nation were a stiff-necked people. And certainly we see the, the stiff-neckedness uh, of their nature here in kind of putting this back in the house of God. Now, it's called the image of jealousy. And the reason is it provoked the Lord to jealousy. And of course, we, we know back in Exodus chapter 20 and the giving of the Ten Commandments, uh, we see that God proclaims without hesitation that he wants the undivided affections of his people. And he is affected by jealousy when they turn away from him to other gods that have done nothing for the people of Israel. And so in verse 5, he says, Thou shalt, this is Exodus 20, verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. And again, I just want to think about this idea of God's jealousy, because sometimes we say, well, isn't jealousy a negative thing? In our minds, it's kind of, a negative thing and of course it can be a negative thing but in one sense when you know if if somebody was uh, flirting with my wife i would be right to feel jealousy because we have a commitment a contractual commitment to love one another till death is due par we're like we're we're one we're we're together and the lord was in that relationship with it. Nobody else had done what he had done for the nation of Israel. In fact, we get to chapter 16 uh, of Ezekiel. He's going to tell us what he did for this nation and and the, the lengths he went to show his love towards this nation and for them to turn their back on him and go after these idols was a terrible abomination. And so this jealousy aspect here. Also, I want to... Uh, just another verse in Exodus, and, we, and we've looked at these before under different contexts, but it's also good to remind ourselves, refresh ourselves. Exodus 34, uh, again, verse 14, For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. And so for them to have the audacity to put this, this Asherah pole to this, this filthy queen of heaven who was the goddess of sex in the very, very sanctuary of God, right next to the brazen altar, right near the entrance, so that when you came in, that's what you saw. You can see why God was jealous because of this. Yeah, their affections were going away from him to this false deity. Verse 4, it says, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. 
And again, this is the contrast is being set up for us it, it, right here in the very sanctuary of God. You have the glory of the God of Israel on the one hand and this image of jealousy, this Asherah Paul on the other hand, God of it. And of course, interesting, it says, uh, and it, it, it's quite emphatic, the glory of the God of Israel. I want you to just notice that the glory of the God of Israel was there. And the, the thought here is this. It was the glory of the God who had loved and chosen Israel, whom Israel should have served, the God who belonged there, unlike these idols. These idols were foreign. They didn't belong there. They had done nothing for the people. They had not redeemed them from Egypt. They had not brought them uh, 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 through the wilderness. They had not brought them into a land uh, then given them homes that they had not built and vineyards that they had not put. He had done nothing. Their gods had done nothing for them. And yet uh, Israel, the God of Israel had done so much for them. And in almost like it's in, in, in sheer ingratitude, for all that God had done, they turned their back on him and they set up this call to sensuality uh, in the very house of God. And by the way, I'm convinced it all stems from ingratitude. Uh, a brother yesterday was preaching on Colossians and one of the things he talked about was in the last days. Uh, Romans chapter one talks about the world. Uh, neither were they thankful. Uh, Second Timothy uh, it talks again about uh, chapter 3, and it, it talks about unthankful, unholy, speaking of the professed people of God. And brethren, if we lose our sense of gratitude for what the Lord has done, it, it'll be very quickly idols will creep into our lives. We, we must guard uh, jealously <laughs> this sense of amazement of what the Lord has done for us. Never lose it. Oh, Lord, you've done so much for me. How could I ever uh, turn away from you when you have gone to such lengths to redeem my soul and do so much for me? And so, again, that's the, the thought that's being conveyed here. Uh, and so, and it's an amazing thing that this glory of the God of Israel is still there <laughs> because we've already seen since the reign of Manasseh, they've been sticking this idol in the house of God. And and don't you get a sense of the long suffering of God that it's almost like the very last minute he reluctantly withdraws his glory from Israel because of their sin. But but he he, he allows his glory to stay there till the very last moment when he just can't stay any longer. And yet uh, amazing uh, the last moment of their rejection of him, such is his long suffering that he finally has to withdraw his presence. And again, we can all say in our own lives, because there's times when we have not been thankful and we have forgotten and maybe we've allowed things to come into our lives. And yet we have to say this, the long suffering of God in our lives is an amazing thing. No wonder we sing, I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned clean how marvelous how wonderful and we could go on and on and if i get so carried away i might start singing it so i better i better get back to the text here i don't want to do that verse five he says then said he unto me son of man lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north so i lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north and behold northward at the gate of the altar this image of jealousy in the entry now, why, why would he want him to see this? Why would He's already talked about it. Why is he saying, look at it again, son of man? And what he's saying is this. It, it It's right by the entry. You used only here, by the way, in Scripture, this term. But the idea is this, that as you came through the temple gate, the first thing that greeted you was this abominable idol. This this whole house was made for one purpose. It was meant to be magnificent because it was meant to be a showcase of the glory of the God of Israel. And when you came through the gate, the first thing you saw was this wicked image of jealousy. And it's an affront to God. That's the idea. Uh, an image unavoidable to anybody coming through that gate. 
And of course, we said that's the gate the priests particularly use. The priests who should have been teaching priests, who should have been teaching the children of Israel how to walk with God. These very priests walk past this thing day in, day out to do their duties and were unmoved by it. Didn't bother them. They kind of, I guess they accepted it. And this is the place where the very glory of God was found. And so this is what's so tragic. And of course, remember, we know the story well, but when, when the tabernacle was constructed, once it was complete, we read in Exodus 40 that the glory of the God of Israel filled the tabernacle. Uh, when Solomon's temple was dedicated, the very same thing, the glory of the God of Israel filled the temple, filled the house. And so the glory of the, of the God of Israel is now still there, and yet they have built this idol system right there in the house of God. And so this is why he wants him to see. He wants Ezekiel to see. He wants Ezekiel, his prophet, to see his absolute justice in withdrawing his glory from the house of God and allowing it to be destroyed, to be to be completely defiled, because they had already defiled it. And so when the Babylonians came in and they burned the house and they defiled the house by killing all these people we see in chapter 9, it was already defiled. It had been defiled a long time ago. And so this is why. And so he wants Ezekiel, his prophet, to know, to understand why, the reason why. It's good to know the reason why. Why is God doing these things? Well, here's the answer. It's not irrational. It's got, it has a basis. There's an absolute reason for God's actions in the way that he is about to act. Verse 6, he said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And so the Lord stresses uh, because of what is being committed in the house of God, this is the reason he must go far off from his sanctuary. There's, there's always a reason. That's why the church of Laodicea, the Lord is outside. There's a reason for that. It, it, it's not irrational. It's stuff that's going on inside the house that is causing him to withdraw from the house. <clears throat> so he's giving his reasoning. He must go far from his sanctuary. See, the, again, we mentioned this last week, but there was a strong feeling amongst the people that they were safe in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and the thinking was this, God would, whom they still regarded, although, you know, so, so they, they gave lip service to the God of Israel, <clears throat> but they, they were, they were double-minded men, unstable in all their ways. They still had some kind of measure of recognition of the God of Israel, but their lives were also filled with idolatry. And so there's this kind of dichotomy going on. <clears throat> but they thought that God, who they still regarded, notwithstanding the idolatry, as powerful national God, the God of Israel, would certainly protect his temple. And I think we looked at this verse last time, but it's good to remind ourselves, Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 7, verse 4, and this was their, their chant, their claim. Uh, they said, um, <clears throat> uh, read from verse 3, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, so on and so forth. But what they were doing is they were they, their whole basis for thinking God will never allow Jerusalem to be destroyed was this is where the temple of the Lord is. And so they felt safe. They felt secure. And the prophet is showing or being shown and he's about to show the children of the captivity that the transgressions of the people is what led the Lord, first of all, to leave the house, his glory to depart, and to hand over the city to desolation. Verse 7, 
He said unto them, defile the house. Oh, that's chapter nine. Sorry. <laughs> chapter eight, verse seven. He brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. So now, again, he's in the temple area, and he sees a wall into the house of God, most likely into the inner court of the house of God, perhaps the holy place. And then he says to me, verse 8, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, the door. So he has to, he sees a little hole, but he has to make it bigger to be able to see what's going on in there. By the way, spiritual application here. Uh, sometimes if we are to see what's really going on, <laughs> sometimes we have to dig a bit deeper. Things can look okay on the surface, but when we dig deeper, we start to see that things are not the way they ought to be. Things are not right. And so clearly, a surface observation was not sufficient. He needed to dig deeper. And by the way, just that principle of digging deeper is really important. I want to just bring out something from Luke's gospel, chapter six, just while we're thinking of this idea of digging deeper. Uh, Luke 6, 48, it's called it's the story of the wise man building his house on the rock. And it says, and of course, we have this picture in our minds of this this big protruding rock, and there's this house on top of it. But actually, it was on level ground, but he had to dig foundations. And so he says in verse 40, he's like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood arose, the streams beat vehemently on that house, could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. So how do we dig deep? He says, he that hears... And doeth not is like the man that without foundation built a house upon the earth, again, which the stream did beat vehemently, immediately it fell, the ruin of the house was great. And so the idea is this, that if we're going to dig deep in the word of God, it's not just hearing it, it's obedience. It's studying the word of God with a thought of active obedience that will able, enable us to stand when the storms of life come our way it's hearing and doing that's what it is to build your house on a rock and it includes this idea of digging deeper so he's digging a hole in the wall and finds a door there as he digs in the wall behold the door verse 9 he said unto me go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here so now we're kind of in the inner sanctuary here and, and what does he see? So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round there about. So when he finally gets in, he sees these things. Now, what was he supposed to see? What would normally be inside the walls of the temple? What would be in the inside the walls, the decor, we, we know it from Chronicles, that in there, there should have been pictures of the cherubim on the wall, and also uh, palm trees. That should have been the what you saw on the walls. But what they had done, and it's interesting, the, 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 the language they use here, uh, he, he saw um, portrayed upon the wall roundabout these creeping things, abominable beasts, and idols. He saw them. Now, they were portrayed. That word portrayed is the idea of literally inscribed. In other words, they, they, had, they had gone in there, somebody had gone in there, and they had painted on the very walls of the inner sanctuary creeping things, abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel. I've mentioned before, and I just want to say it again. If you look at Romans with me just for a second, chapter 1, we've often thought that Romans chapter 1 is just talking about the pagan world who saw God's light in creation and turned their back on it. But I am more and more convinced that what he is talking about actually is the nation of Israel, not the pagan world. The batch sample. Of the, of the nation of Israel. And the thought is this. You see, they are the only nation that had the glory of God. Uh, to whom pertaineth the glory and the covenants, Romans chapter 9. Uh, it belonged to them. 
the glory of the God of Israel dwelt amongst them. And so this is where we read verse 23 of Romans chapter 1. It says, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They, who did this? Was it the pagan world? No, this the nation of Israel. They've got the glory of God right there in the very sanctuary, and they make an exchange. And instead of being taken up with the glory of the God of Israel, they make images like corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. So now we go back to Ezekiel, and we see he talks about, behold, every form of creeping things. So if the Asherah pole was sensual worship, now we're seeing nature worship. In other words, it's it's God's, not the creator, but the creation, the things that God made is now being worshipped in the inner sanctuary of the house of God. The interior of the temple was supposed to have cherubim surrounding God's throne portrayed on the walls. Instead, it had filthy idols. What are these things? Uh, three different things, creeping things, abominable beasts, and all the idols. Creeping things are associated with the ground and reminders of the curse put upon Satan in the Garden of Eden. Okay, so so you have uh, creeping things, things that go on their belly. Uh, the creeping things are on the walls. And then abominable beasts, this would be all kinds of unclean animals which were not only forbidden as food, but were considered to be defiling even to touch, and they have got them in the house of God. All and all the idols of the house of Israel, all of these things were there. Idols that have been introduced over the years, beginning with Solomon, they were all displayed in the inside of the house of God. Now, some have suggested, if you remember seeing portrayals of the Egyptian deities. Um, of course, they were the sworn enemy of the Chaldeans. And one of the things that we find when we look at um, the fall of Jerusalem is that they were constantly looking to Egypt for help. They, they were depending on Egypt to come to their rescue. And so could it be that in their uh, secretly in the house of God, they had put these Egyptian deities on the walls. And of course, uh, the Egyptians, they worshipped oxen, asses, goats, dogs, cats, serpents, crocodiles, uh, the, the bird, ibis. And you can see it in Egyptian kind of uh, pictures and inscriptions that you see. And it seems like that that maybe they they were hoping for deliverance, not from the God of, of Israel, but from Egypt. And so they had put the Egyptian deities on the inside of the house of God. And now our attention is drawn in verse 11 to 70 elders. It says, there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. So these 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. We'd say 70 elders, men of the ancients, the older men, the ancient men. These, these elders who had been set up by God to assist Moses in judging Israel. Now we see it back in the book of Numbers. Let's just go back there to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. And of course, these were to aid in applying the law to everyday life of the Israelite. That was their responsibility, taking some of the weight off the shoulders of Moses. In Numbers 11, 16 and 17, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, Bring them to the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. I'll come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, and thou 
that thou bear it not thyself alone. So these 70 men, they were basically assisting Moses in applying the Mosaic covenant to everyday life of the average Israelite. And so here's the 70 men in the days of Ezekiel. And so they're still keeping the tradition going of having 70 men designated as elders who are responsible to make these kind of judgments. But where are they? They stood before them. Before what? Before these abominable images. So in other words, worshipping these images are none other than the 70 elders of Israel, of the house of Israel. In the midst of them, he says, he brings his attention to one particular individual, a man called Jazanir, the son of Shaphan. Now, Jazanir, his name means the Lord hears. But obviously, he wasn't living up to his name. And he didn't think the Lord was paying much attention. We're going to see that as we proceed in this verse. But what's so sad about this man Shaphan being emphasized, Jazania, the son of Shaphan, is that he was originally from a faithful family historically. So let's look back to 2 Kings 22, and we'll see that there's a, a history of this family being loyal and faithful. He was a, found in 2 Kings 22, verse 8 through 11, and uh, this is, again, during the days of Josiah's revival. And it says, Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work and have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest had delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. So the very man that had discovered the word of God, sadly, hidden in the house of God. <laughs> what a tragedy. But he found it and he read it to the king. So this is the son of, of Shaphan, Jazanir. And again, we, we see elsewhere, we see in, in a couple of references in Jeremiah about this man and his faithfulness uh, to the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah 26, 24, it says, Nevertheless, the hand of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. <clears throat> so one of his sons Again, didn't want Jeremiah to be put to death. He's trying to protect Jeremiah. So there's this loyalty, this faithfulness uh, of Shaphan's descendants here. Chapter 39, Jeremiah 39, verse 14. We read, even they sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison and committed him unto Ged Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, that he should carry him home. So he dwelt among the people. So up to now, all of Shaphan and his descendants all seem to be good men who are sympathetic to God's prophet, sympathetic to God's word. And now here's the black sheep of the house of Shaphan, this man, Jazanir. Sadly, he does not follow in the footsteps of such a dignified family. He's the prodigal. He's the wayward one. And here he is amongst the 70 elders, still has a respected place in the society, but right amongst them is this man worshiping these creeping things and abominable beasts. And I suppose it tells us, doesn't it, that, that godliness does not run in the blood, sadly. And we know that, don't we? Samuel would tell you that. Uh, his sons were worthless sons. Eli would tell you that. And many examples in the word of God would tell you that, that godliness is not passed on genetically. People have to make their own decisions if they're going to follow the Lord. And sadly, this family 
where there's been a godly influence and at least two sons we've read about of Shaphan have been loyal to the Lord. But now we have one who is extremely disloyal and God points it out. And notice as well, again, back in this verse, uh, it says, um, every man with his censer in his hand, the end of verse 11, and a thick cloud of incense went up. So they've, they've got uh, incense that they're offering before the Lord. Of course, incense is a picture of the prayers of the saints that ascend before God's throne in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 8. These sweet odors is the, is the prayers of saints. Uh, and so the burning of incense was something that was used in the worship of God. And now they had taken that which was used in the worship of God and were now burning that incense to these creeping things and abominable beasts and idols in the house of Israel. They'd even adopted God's methodology and were using it in the worship of idols. And so he says, as a result of this, verse 12, he says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, the Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. So the leaders thought that the Lord could not see them, and they denied his omniscience and omnipresence. At the same time, they attributed deity to lifeless idols who couldn't see and couldn't hear. <laughs> you, you, you see how warped this is? The, the God who can see, they said he can't see. And the gods that could not see these idols, they were burning incense to them. How perverted can it get? But it comes down to this. Wrong theology results in wrong conduct all the time. If you don't have a right view of God, that God is omniscient and omnipresent, then you might do things in the dark and think that nobody's watching and God is not watching. And what it comes down to is unbelief. You really don't believe what God says in his word. God says his eyes are all seeing. Nothing is hid from his eyes. And so this kind of nonsense of doing things in secret in the cost, that's the emphasis here. Seeing what the ancient of the house of Israel do in the dark. By the way, if you have to do something in the dark, it's probably what you're doing you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> Walk in the light as he is in the light, right? We're to be children of the light, children of the day, not of the night, not of the darkness. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. And so tragic that the same attitude exists today among so many of us, if we're really honest. Sometimes we say we believe what the Bible says about God, but we live as if we don't believe it. That what is really true, we, by our lives, show that we think it's false. Secret worship of idols under the shadow of the Almighty was a very, very wicked thing. How many professing Christians who in public are ready to condemn what is generally acknowledged to be wrong, but in private, in the imagination of their hearts, the secrecy of their own homes, they dwell on the very forbidden things that they would publicly speak out against. The Bible calls that hypocrisy. Lord, deliver us from hypocrisy. Help us to be real, authentic saints of God. Our time is gone. Amen.